Welcome back on the second video in this series where we are looking into the basic working principles and the ideas behind repairing switch mode power supplies. In the previous video we have covered in detail the power input section of a switch mode power supply. We have discussed the functionality of an NTC which is then limiting the inrush current going into a bulk DC filter capacitor. I have also explained that after this large bulk mains filter capacitor, we normally split the power in two different paths. The split in the power path into two different paths is caused by the fact that in modern devices we want to have some advanced functionality. As a real life example, let us suppose that this power supply is in a LCD TV. Here is then our LCD TV sitting nicely on the desk. And as you know, nowadays everyone is like to be very comfy. So they're gonna take the remote control, sit in the sofa and push the power button. And interestingly, the TV turns on even though it was turned off. So now let us really go through the process of what is actually happening. So at the beginning, we assume that the TV is is kind of turned off. We're gonna see the catch in a moment. So we're gonna start with that state. Then of course we have to read somehow the status of the remote control. So we are playing a game here very similar to a child. You know when you are traveling then they always ask are we there yet? You respond no. They ask again are we there yet? And so forth. And this is the same game what is played by a microcontroller in this case. So you can imagine all the suspense in the life of the microcontrollers what they have. So practically they always monitor is someone pushing the remote control? Is someone trying to turn on the TV? And most of the time the response is simply no. However, when you take now the remote control and you push the power button, then of course the TV need to turn on. So then we are going here on this part of the decision and then the microcontroller have to really now turn on the TV. You have most probably asked yourself, where is the catch in this thing? I don't get it. I mean, I just push the remote control, the TV turns on, everything is fine. And let me tell you what the catch is. Namely, if this TV here would have been really, really 100% totally turned off, would it have been able to actually get the signal from the remote control and actually turn on when you push the button on the remote control? And crystal clearly the response is no, the TV, at least the microcontroller portion of the TV had to work. And of course this means that we have to provide some sort of power to this microcontroller portion, which is the so-called standby circuit. After this explanation, I think it should be a lot more clear why it is so important to first of all figure out whether the standby circuit portion of your device is actually being powered and that the standby portion is really working properly because if there is no standby power, then we crystal clearly we are simply not able to ever send the actual turn on signal. And the other implication of this is that whenever you plug in your device into the power grid, once you turn on the mains clunking power switch, and actually many TVs doesn't even have nowadays such a clunking power switch. So once you plug in your device, then automatically the low power standby portion will start up of the power supply. It will power the low power microcontrollers and other stuff which needs to work before your real device can be turned on by the microcontroller. When it comes to personal computers, then the standby power going to the motherboard and the real main power is a bit even more complex. So we're gonna discuss computers and ATX power supplies at later videos. Now we're gonna turn back to more simple explanations. So we are coming back to this slide with the bifurcation of the powered parts. I got the code again, but I'm gonna produce this video no matter what. So anyway, coming back. In a simplified view, you have to look at this here, like as an example you would have an animal or a person in a sleep. It means that their brain function and heart and so forth still need to keep on working. And this is exactly what is done by the standby circuit. Whenever you poke them or you wake them up somehow, then they have to go suddenly into the woken up high power state. And this is exactly why we have here this bifurcation of the power. 
Most of the time it is really easy to spot whether you have a standby power and a high power portion in a power supply by simply visually inspecting the board and if you're gonna find a large transformer and a smaller transformer then you can be almost sure that this small transformer is doing the standby function and the large transformer after it is woken up of course by the electronics which is feeding the transformer then it is responsible for providing the main high power state. I have purposefully said that you can be almost sure when it comes to this small transformer that it is the standby transformer and that is because in some circuits they use things which look like a transformer However, in reality, their functionality is to be a coil in the active power factor correction on the printed circuit board. The functionality of the active power factor correction circuit is really, really complicated, especially when one is talking about a so-called breachless active power factor correction circuit when we are not using a grades breach rectifier. And because of that, I'm gonna totally ignore the active power factor correction and we can assume that we are using a old, old power supply before the PFC standard was really applied. So we're gonna totally ignore this and we're gonna say that after the inrush current limiting, we directly go into the back filter capacitor. And I'm doing this because this will simplify the whole explanation considerably and it will make a more clear picture in your mind. Of course, once we fully cover the switch mode power supply block diagram and the basics, we're gonna come back to the passive and active power factor correction. So this material is not lost, it is only shifted to future videos. After we have established that there is a major difference in functionality between the standby circuit and the high power portion of the switch mode power supply, as I will show you in future videos and future slides, the actual way how these two transformers are being fed from this bug filter capacitor is very much similar. So this of course means that we need to dive really, really deep into the electronics portion of a switch mode power supply so that we understand what are these components doing and why do we need to feed the transformers? Why cannot we just put in the AC voltage on the transformers like in a traditional power supply? When we start talking about these electronic components and their function, it would mean that right away Way we could jump into advanced topics like pass width modulation, sawtooth signals, distorted AC, Schottky diodes and such. However, in my view, this is a way too large jump. So instead, I'd like to cover first of all how does a simple inductor work in a circuit because once we understand the simple inductor or coil as you wish to call it, it is so much easier to comprehend the idea of pass width modulation and also how can we actually control the outgoing voltage and the outgoing power via pass width modulation and why do we need the optocoupler and the feedback to control this pass width modulation. In switch mode power supplies at the end of the day such inductors and transformers are doing the real magic. One of the most important ingredients in this magic sauce is this pass width modulation which is the actual switching technique where we are switching from the bug DC capacitor DC voltage through a transformer or a coil and we are doing it very very fast. This is what you see here in the shape of the signal and since the pass fit modulation and the behavior of the inductor is the most important so stay tuned for the follow up video.